Hello ladies, gents, and everyone. It is a Monday, August 7th, and we're here to talk about this month's space and astronomy news. July 5th saw the last ever launch of the Ariane 5. So that launch, VA-261, from the European spaceport in French Guiana, marked the end of an era that spanned 117 launches and almost three decades. Ariane 5 was developed and operated for the European Space Agency by the private company Ariane Space. And notable payloads launched by Ariane 5 include ESA missions like XMM Newton, Rosetta, Planck, Bepi Colombo, JWST, and just this year in the penultimate launch of the Ariane 5, Juice. Now the replacement vehicle, Ariane 6, was planned to be in operation by 2020, so that there would be a few overlapping years between Ariane 5 and Ariane 6. However, there have been some delays, and now the first launch of Ariane 6 is expected no earlier than 2024. Just in July, a test of the Ariane 6 did not achieve its goal of main engine ignition, though ESA still said that the test was considered very satisfactory. As ESA waits for this new rocket, it can either postpone any planned launches until the Ariane 6 is available, or it can look for alternative alternative launching solutions. For example, the HERA mission, which is scheduled to launch in late 2024, has already changed from planning to use Ariane 6 to using SpaceX's Falcon 9. One ESA mission that recently launched on board a Falcon 9, the cosmology mission Euclid, just reached a big milestone at the end of July. First light. First light is basically just the first use of a telescope to take an astronomical image. This is huge because it basically means the telescope works, even if there are still tweaks to be made for it to achieve optimal performance. So while these images won't really be used for science, they're still very exciting and show that the telescope is fully aligned and focused. This image is taken by the VIS instrument, which captures visible light, and this image is taken by the NISP instrument, which captures near-infrared light. Each of these cutouts covers an area of the sky that's about 49 square arc minutes. That means it would take about 14 of them to cover the area of the full moon. Now over the course of its six-year survey, Euclid will take over one million observations of these little squares. July also saw the successful launch of India's lunar mission Chandrayaan-3. The mission launched on July 14th and just this past weekend it has successfully been inserted into lunar orbit. Chandrayaan-3 is carrying a rover that it will attempt to land on the lunar surface to conduct scientific experiments near the South Pole. This is sort of a take two, a follow-up to the Chandrayaan-2 mission, which unfortunately crashed during its landing attempt back in 2019. If Chandrayaan-3 is successful, India will become only the fourth nation ever to conduct a controlled landing on the lunar surface. And that landing attempt will happen later this month. So there are two main theories about how giant planets form, and one of these, core accretion, has gathered a fair bit of observational evidence to support it. The idea with core accretion is that kind of small building blocks within the protoplanetary disk start to stick together, and they build together into larger and larger bodies until eventually it becomes so massive that it can basically suck all this gas in from the protoplanetary disk and make a giant planet. The other formation mechanism is called gravitational instability or disk instability. This is more like how stars form but in miniature, so you have a cloud of gas and dust that kind of collapses in on itself and forms a planet. But this has never been observed until now. Astronomers used ESO's VLT and the ALMA observatory to observe the young star V960 Mon. What they found was spiral arm structure in the star's disk, and within those arms, evidence of clumping that the arms were starting to fragment, aka possibly the beginning of gravitational instability to form a giant planet. This is a really exciting observation, and hopefully this will help us learn more about how planets form throughout the galaxy. The sun is often described as a boring, average, kind of middle-of-the-road kind of star, which it is, and we love it for that. But that might make you believe that we kind of know all there is to know about the sun, but that is not the case. Exhibit A, a paper published last week that used six years of solar observations from the Hawk Observatory and determined that the sun is actually emitting way more high-energy photons than we expected. These high-energy photons, which are called very high-energy gamma rays, because astronomers think that very counts as a classification, <laughs> are emitted when cosmic rays interact with the sun's magnetic field. Now, previous instruments were capable of detecting these gamma rays, but only up to a certain energy level, until Hawk Observatory came around and gave us access to this regime of, like, tera-electron volt gamma rays. That means light that has a wavelength of around 10 to the minus 18th meters. <laughs> and yeah, they found way more of these very high energy gamma rays than they were expecting, which means we still have a lot to learn about what exactly is going on with our sun. 
You've probably heard by now that the US Congress held a hearing about UAPs. UAPs, of course, being the modernized acronym for UFOs. We went from unidentified flying objects to unidentified aerial phenomena or unidentified anomalous phenomena. Now, this is actually a great change because it better reflects what's happening here because not all of these observations are actual objects. Now, kind of the big centerpiece of this hearing was a retired Air Force major who claimed that he had knowledge of the US government possessing crashed UAPs as well as non-human biologics. But this major had not claimed to see any of this himself. He said this was information he had gathered from testimony from other people. And, and absolutely no evidence was presented. Just the testimony. His testimony. About other people's testimony. <laughs> a lot of you have asked my opinion about this, and so let me just say this. Um, I do believe that UAPs are real. That is to say, a percentage of people who report seeing these UAPs, this phenomena, are actually seeing something. That is, they're not just hallucinating or seeing an optical illusion. However, unidentified does not mean extraterrestrial. And as they say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and we literally have no evidence here. So yeah, I remain very skeptical. <laughs> We had a bit of a scare with the venerable Voyager 2 spacecraft over the past couple of weeks, but spoiler alert, there is a happy ending here. Voyager 2 is over 45 years old and is over 12 billion miles away from Earth, but it's actually still sending data back to us from some of its surviving instruments via the Deep Space Network. However, on July 21st, a command sent to the spacecraft caused it to move its antenna out of alignment with the Earth, and so communications were basically broken. And without the antenna to receive a new command, we couldn't send a new command telling it to readjust the antenna the way it was supposed to be. Now, luckily, the Voyager spacecraft are programmed to basically reorient themselves to Earth every so often. So this wouldn't have been a permanent break in communications, but the next reorientation wasn't due to happen until mid-October. So it would have been a pretty long stretch of time to go without any communications with the spacecraft. But NASA noticed that they were still receiving a very faint signal from the spacecraft. Now, this was too faint to actually be red, but it was enough to indicate that the spacecraft was at least still operating, and it made them think maybe it could still hear them if they were loud enough. So that's what they did. They basically sent what they're calling a shout <laughs> to the spacecraft, telling it to point its antenna back here at us. Now, the light travel time meant they had a 37-hour wait to see if that command worked, but just after midnight on August 4th, Voyager 2 data began flowing back through DSA again. And it turned out that during this couple weeks of silence, the spacecraft was operating normally and its trajectory was unaffected. So all's well this ends well, and communications are again flowing between us and our second furthest spacecraft. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. That is all the news I have for you. Please join me again next month for the first Monday of the month where we will talk about August space and astronomy news. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a good one. Bye!